Good morning, David and Shelby and Joanne and George Ann. Hi, you bags. Hi, Becky. It's good to see you all this morning. The windows are open and I can hear the birds chirping, but I'm not sure that it's going to be too much of an interruption for you all. I don't think you can hear them. I miss you all too. The longer this goes on, the weirder it gets, even though it's maybe getting a little bit normal, and yet it's still so abnormal. I don't know, but I miss you all. Hi, Dad. <clears throat> there are two things that I want to talk about this morning. One of them is raising white kids in a racist country. And the other is the fact that we are getting ready to welcome to Louisville our pastoral candidate, Mary Alice Bird Whistle. And while they're two seemingly completely different things, I think there are some threads that'll tie this conversation together at least a little bit. I want to say thank you. Thank you so much for being Highland Baptist Church and showing up at the vigil yesterday. There were over 80 of us, and that's from those of you who I was able to count or to see from a distance. And that doesn't include those of you who were there at other parts of the crowd. That's so wonderful that we were able to come together and stand in peace and solidarity with our people of color siblings. Thanks for making the effort on a beautiful Sunday afternoon to give up time to, to do that, to show up to Central Park in, here in Louisville and to lament and to confess and to cry out and to pray with people of all different faiths. It was a beautiful thing to be able to stand there with you all. Yeah, I see the hearts flying. Um, thanks for thanks for being there. Thanks for being Highland Baptist Church and for the ways that we are willing to step into these tough conversations and live in the tension of our privilege and our predominant whiteness and the ways that we are able to say no justice, no peace uh, yesterday through prayer and silence and, uh, like I said, confession. So it was really, really wonderful to see you all there. And thanks to David and Stephen for providing our meeting point outside their beautiful home, which was right across from where we needed to be. That worked out wonderfully. I want to highlight this book today, Raising White Kids, Bringing Up Children in a Racially Unjust America by Jennifer Harvey. She uh, is a white woman, and she did her PhD at Union Seminary in New York City under James Cone, who, if you know him, is a, uh, was a prophet and a professor and uh, a public intellectual who wrote um, prolifically. And one of his uh, more recent books is The Cross and the Lynching Tree, but there are so many. And so she is his student, and she has written a couple of different books and articles that you can find on the web. And I referenced this book as a good resource for us in the newsletter last week. And she recently did a webinar last week as well, and they were expecting a couple hundred people. And there were over uh, several thousand. 
In fact, they were worried that the, the website was going to crash and people were commenting, this is not a moment, this is a movement. And so we get to participate in this conversation. And so I wanna highlight her today, even though it's about bringing up white kids, I think that it's about bringing up all of us into greater awareness, into the ways that we seek to be people who are woke, into ways that we need to participate in this movement that is rising up across the country right now. I don't know if you've seen any of the coverage from Washington DC and other major cities about what was going on this weekend, but um, people all around us, not just here in Louisville or not just in Minneapolis are saying enough and policies are being changed. It's making a difference. And so as we continue to show up, as we continue to be a congregation and a people of faith and followers of Jesus who show up in a very specific way, but in a pluralistic crowd with a specific message, uh, I think we do well to continue to remember that we are all children. Theologically, we're children of the divine. Socially, we are children of this movement as we have so much to learn. So I hope this will be a point of education for all of us. I'm reading from a chapter that's called Diversity is Confusing. And she's making the point that how do we differentiate between white and racist on an individual level and then on a systemic level. And so here's what she has to say about teaching our kids how this can be so confusing. <clears throat> One strategy, a strategy for addressing this conversation emerges from understanding the precise reasons diversity is so confusing. For example, when we talk about something like black history and culture, a significant dimension of what we are talking about is the resistance, creativity, and agency of African American people who have lived in response to the domination of white racial hierarchy. Learning about the histories and the cultures of communities of color is critical for white children and youth. And I think that that's something that we know at Highland. I'm not going to say we do that well. I think we're practicing it um, through our displays in February that the anti-racism team holds up for us through the awareness that um, history has been whitewashed. And so what do we need to read in order to pay attention to the fact that our African American siblings are as much as part, if not more so, a part of American history than their white counterparts. Okay, and I realize this is kind of dense reading to hear it. Um, so I can't say that I won't offer more commentary, but here we go, let, let me keep reading. But parents must also offer white children and youth a meaningful place to stand or a way to meaningfully participate in diversity. This isn't a suggestion to say to our kids, let's celebrate white culture. Rather, offering white youth a meaningful place to stand means sharing with them models of white people, those who have lived in the past and those who are alive and active today, who live agency against racism. Such a commitment doesn't mean shifting focus away from people of color or downplaying the painful history of white complicity with racism. It means recognizing that white children desperately need examples of people who have created a gap between who they were and are as selves in the systems of white supremacy in which they have lived and do live. So for example, in terms of offering meaningful participation in the context of diversity, this does not mean celebrating George Washington because he founded the nation and was white. It means making sure we lift up and celebrate someone like John Brown, who also was white and was so horrified by slavery, he acted to end it. It doesn't mean overstating to our kids how much better things became as a result of the civil rights movement or how many white people were involved in it. Parenthetical, let's not forget that many white people still alive today opposed or were apathetic toward the civil rights movement at the time. But it does mean sharing with them stories about people like Joan Trumpauer Mulholland. She was a young white woman from Virginia, so active in protesting segregation as part of the Black-led organizing notably during the Freedom Rides in 1961, that she was arrested, and you can still find her mugshot online. Her family disowned her. 
It doesn't mean that when we teach our children about the reality of police violence against African American communities, we make sure to tell them that most white police officers are good. It does mean sharing images with them of white people who are so horrified by police violence against black people that they show up to protest with and in support of black communities as they challenge this violence. And as there were many police officers at the, at the vigil yesterday, not on duty, but standing with the people um, to participate in this cry of lament and in these prayers for hope, we can see the difference between an individual critique of our police systems versus the systemic one. And that's such an important distinction to say that not all police officers are evil, but that we're saying the system as a whole is racist and needs to be counteracted and can practice evil. Okay, so Jennifer Harvey goes on, I'm almost finished. I can't say enough that the teaching here is not that there is a strong justice commitment in white culture, there isn't. This would be a false teaching. And frankly, there is no abstract or easy answer to the diversity problem for white kids. In fact, a core hope behind this book is that by differently raising white kids today, we contribute to creating a future in which this real problem of white identity is less difficult because models of anti-racist white commitment become so much more increased and white supremacy's power decreased. Here's the point. The point is that we need to practice taking some postures we discussed before in the book. Those that make us fellow pilgrims with our children. And then we need to find routes to invite them to see and to create concrete ways, places, and activities through which we disallow being white from determining our behavior or our allegiances. We need to help them experience in their own bodies that being white doesn't have to only or primarily mean complicity with racist structures. I think when we can do that, I think that when we can communicate children and remember for ourselves that being white, that there are ways to be white without complicity, complicitness, and without participating through our silence and racist structures, then we feel more empowered as white people to exercise our agency in this conversation. It's still scary. And diversity is still confusing because on one hand, we want to show up and we want to use our voice, but we're so used to centering ourselves in the conversation that we know we need to be careful about that. And then on the other hand, we know enough now to say to not do anything and to avoid the conversations of race is to participate in the white silence. And so it's confusing. How do we show up? How do we participate in these conversations? And when we do what Jennifer Harvey is saying here and we look to models for us of white people who have bridged that gap, uh, we know that we're not alone in this conversation. And we know that we're not alone as white people who are so early in the conversation of race. We have so much learning still to do. And this, this book is a beautiful, empowering tool that can support us and also not let us off the hook. I saw a really fantastic meme and I'm not gonna quote all of it because I would butcher it because I should have looked it up before this. Um, but it, it says something, it's highlighting the point. It was a, a political cartoon that uh, white people are tired of this conversation since we have been doing our best to be engaged in it for the last two weeks. And it's juxtaposing that against the reality that black people and brown people and indigenous people have this conversation every day of their lives because they live in a white world and are struggling to make sense of that. And yet we're allowed to be fatigued because this is relatively new for us. And so I wanna hold all of that in conversation today and to make space for all of that you're feeling. And I want to share some good news. Did you know that last night in the middle of the night, our city removed the John B. Castleman statue 
that is at the corner, the intersection of Cherokee Road and Cherokee Parkway. There's an article in the Courier about it this morning. And for those of you who are watching who aren't from Louisville or who aren't members of Highland Baptist, this is a statue of a white supremacist who that is just uh, not even a quarter of a mile down the street from us. And people have been protesting the presence of this statue for years now, in fact. And also that new conversation has been raised about the Jefferson Davis statue that is in the rotunda of our state capitol. The governor is raising concern about this and starting early conversation about what it would mean to uh, remove it. And so there are slow but important progresses that are happening as a result of, of our work of our protesting, of our standing alongside Black Lives Matter and other organizations that are led by people of color here in our city and around the country. Isaiah 40 says, I am about to do a new thing. It is about to spring up. Do you not perceive it? It's Isaiah 40 and it's this whole passage that where Isaiah is, um, speaking on behalf of God to marginalized people saying this death and destruction and oppression is not the final word. It's springing forth this new movement. And here's the thread that's going to connect this as I pivot in this conversation. There is a new movement at Highland Baptist Church and her name is Mary Alice Bird Whistle. And you have been introduced to her online and through from our search committee through videos and Facebook. I hope that you are exercising our ability of contemporary technology so that you can Facebook stalk her and pursue her sermons um, through her church website and Zoom online. Her last two sermons have been um, rock star status as she invites her own congregation into these conversations. And I know that she is uh, Facebook stalking us in all of the beautiful ways, trying to learn more about who and what we are. And look at all the hearts flying. Isn't this so exciting and amazing? In fact, um, I saw her log on and watching. I'm not sure if she's still watching now, but Mary Alice, uh, we are already falling in love with you. We can't wait to meet you. Uh, more fully this weekend. Thank goodness for technology and that in the midst of this pandemic, we can move forward uh, with fortitude and perseverance and grace and hopefully good hospitality to you as we uh, prepare to consider all that the search committee is bringing to us in celebration of who you are and the gifts and the vision that you have for our con congregation and the ways that the spirit is continuing to inspire and um, point to the beauty of our coming together. It's a wonderful bit of hope in the midst of the pain of the world. And so we have so much work ahead of us this week, Highland. continue to pay attention so that you can do your due diligence in getting to know Mary Alice. Yes, she is still here. She says hello. Um, be informed about her qualities as a minister and her giftedness as a unique child of God and um, be prayerful about what we need as a congregation in this new day this new day of what's going on in our world of saying and putting on the marquee unabashedly, but theologically, that Black Lives Matter. This new day of taking ourselves as white people out of the center of the conversation and uplifting minority and marginalized and oppressed voices so that we can be students, so that we can pay attention to the Spirit's work in the world this new day where God is doing a new thing that springs forth and it is up to us to perceive it. And so may we assume postures of humility, of being students, 
and of a deep intrinsic joy that even in the midst of ongoing pain and tragedy and heartache that exists for so many people and so many people groups and so many systems around our country, that we can still claim hope, that we can still claim that joy, and that we can still live together in a way that is authentic and in service to the God that we know and love and serve. It's a gift to be in ministry with you. I feel like a broken record when I say that, and yet I haven't found a new phrase that encapsulates um, how precious this is, that we are in this work together, and that we are getting welcome, ready to welcome a new minister to join us in all that God has planned for us. It is a new thing, and it springs forth. I, as one of your ministers, and on behalf of all of my colleagues, hope that you perceive it, for we get to join in it together. Blessings on your week, blessings on the day ahead of you today, blessings on our Black and Brown and Indigenous people of color who are fighting for their freedom, blessings on all of us who seek to come alongside the conversation and study and do our best to know what we need to know so that we can act in ways that we need to act. Blessings, so many blessings on all of you. I love you, I miss you, and I look forward to seeing you again, hopefully sooner than later. Thanks for being with me today. <laughs>